Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be turned back to you, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's Easter. Let me turn it down just a little bit. It's Easter. Jesus is alive. Christ is risen. We're so good at that. Christ is risen. But why are we so good at that? Is it because we believe it? Yeah. But is it also because we've memorized it and we're expected to say it even when we don't believe it? The priest on Easter said Christ is risen. And my spiritual director told me that she didn't say it back. She didn't feel like Easter. She was angry. She was full of doubt. And in her honesty with me, Ooh, it gave me space to breathe. Because I felt the same way. It seems sometimes like resurrection isn't a present reality. It's a past event, or it's a promise for our future, way out in front of us. But friends, we who doubt gather with those first disciples right there at the empty grave. They're not singing Christ the Lord is risen today. They're not saying hallelujah. They're staring at emptiness. And they're disappointed and they're hurt. For they had hoped. That afternoon, actually, several of them decided to just go on home to Emmaus to return to the fishing nets and the collecting of taxes and the missed appointments, to return on the road back to their human condition, as T.S. Eliot wrote, to maintain themselves by their common routine, to learn to avoid excessive expectations, right? Because their expectations about Jesus had gotten them nowhere. We had hoped he was going to be the one to redeem us, we had hoped. I invite you to turn into your new Bibles. Children, your old Bibles, your pew Bibles, to help one another find Luke chapter 24, to hear this story on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. Now on that same day, the two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things, these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have, hap have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was the prophet, a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and of all and all of and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condem condemned in death and crucified him. But what he had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since the, these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. 
They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them interpreted them to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they would go, he walked ahead as if he was going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they could recognize him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, We were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Our children volunteered to read scripture less than an hour ago, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Reading right from their new Bibles just minutes after receiving them. We had hoped. We had hoped for a cure, for an answer. We had hoped for romance and love. We had hoped for inclusion, a way forward. We had hoped for our health, that it would last. We had hoped that the depression, that it would die. We had hoped that the job would bring meaning. We had hoped the family would forgive one another. We had hoped. And Jesus meets them right there. He doesn't go to Jerusalem. He doesn't wait for them in Emmaus. He meets them on the journey, right? Right in the middle of their we had hoped and all of the unmet expectations. And when he meets them, what does he do? Well, he opens up the Bible, the scripture. And beginning with Moses, he, it says, he again tells them the stories, but this time how he fulfills all of those stories. You see, Emmaus is not just a Jesus appearance. It's not just a proof of resurrection. It is also about how resurrection gives sense to all the other stories that come before it, right? Do we get it? Do we see? A few years ago, a loved one of mine who will remain nameless <laughs> had to pass an eye exam for a part-time job. And I was worried because he'd been telling me that he thought his vision was getting worse, and so I thought, there's no way he's going to pass this test. But he was really confident about it. So he went in for this eye exam, right? And he passed it. Well, a couple weeks later, he actually went to the eye doctor and discovered that actually his vision had gotten a lot worse, and he was going to need some corrective right, lenses. And I said to him, well, then how did you pass that eye exam a couple weeks ago? And he said, I memorized the chart. <laughs> Christ is risen. Christ is 
We memorize the words and we pass the test. But do we see? Jesus holds up resurrection. Like my eye doctor this week held up new lenses, because again, I need new lenses. Jesus holds up resurrection like lenses so that we might see. And through resurrection, to see the scriptures and understand them. And yes, that our expectations have been met and that yes, love lives. Theologian Mark Davis invites us to do just that. Genesis 1 and 2, creation stories through resurrection become a part of a larger story of life. The seed must die for life to come again. The story of the flood in Genesis 6, through the lens of resurrection, shows how out of sheer devastation there is a remnant of hope and future. The story of the covenant between Abram and Sarai and God through the lens of resurrection becomes a story about a couple that are infertile, where there is death, suddenly, though, life comes to bless nations. The rise and fall of power, the, the suffering and returning of the exiles, the hope of one to come, all stories of how resurrection is still alive for right now. You see, without resurrection, this book of stories, the Bible, is only about stories that happen but don't happen anymore. But with resurrection, this book, this Bible, these stories are, yes, stories that continue to happen in our lives even today. God lives. You see, Jesus' resurrection is a corrective, right? to our short-sighted Easter vision that sees all of this as a thing of the past. A corrective for our far-sighted idea of Easter that it only has to do with our future. You know what that sounds like, right? I was taught this as a child. Believe in Jesus, and when you die, you will have eternal life. But friends, if that's all we do with resurrection, then we are being unfaithful to the story. Because if that's all we do with it, then creation doesn't matter right now. Then our health and bodies don't matter right now. Then justice does not matter right now. Resurrection, yes, is about the present reality of resurrection, yes, for us. When Moses is in front of God in the burning bush, God is not saying, go tell those slaves just to hang on till the end of their life. It'll get better then, right? God shows up in the burning bush to say, by my power, resurrection hope is now for liberation now, for power and love over oppression, over that which pushes us down, over death. Resurrection correction for our spiritual lives right now increases the value of life right now. Life wherever we find life, in the community, in one another, even in our enemy, right? Where there is life, there is God. Value in ice melting, rivers drying up. Value in people in Syria and Mexico and Durham, east, west. Value in our brothers and sisters, L and G and B, T, Q, I. Value for the four men executed this week in Arkansas. Kenneth, Liddell, Robert, Mark. Before the drug that they injected would become illegal, Tomorrow. Resurrection correction, friends, means that we see the right now power of a living Jesus for all lives right now.
last Sunday night in Tennessee, I was sitting about four pews back in that church. When baby Owen was baptized, body, mind, soul, and brain tumor. His mother, Amanda, who was a pastor, after the baptism, took him in her arms, and she looked at the hundreds of us who had gathered to weep and to hope. And she said, in the Bible, God anoints what is God. God anoints what God claims. God anoints what God loves. And tonight, I anoint my baby Owen as a sign that he is God, God's, and God loves Owen. And then we met that mother at the communion table to tell the story again, body, bread, broken. Because that's when we see, that's when they see in the story, right? They don't see until they eat with Jesus and the bread is broken. Bible and bread together. Because the word Bible explains the bread, the sacrament. They go together. Making it a reality for the disciples, this bread, but only because Jesus has told the story in the Bible. You see, resurrection, correction at the table and today at the font means that the power of God now is alive for all lives right now. The bread and the Bible together that breaks open again our hearts and our eyes to see God in the midst of the very things that leave us hopeless sometimes and take our breath away and hurt our hearts. That yes, especially there is the hope of Jesus. But what if all I'm able to do is recite the lines that I've memorized? This book was not written for me. It was written for us. These are stories not given to a person, but to a people. Almost every you in the Bible is actually a y'all. Southern friends. I need you and you need me together because sometimes I can't see that we would break bread together, that we would sit down as I did on Wednesday morning with 20 of you and open up the word together, that we would open up our stories and continue to point to Jesus' love that is living now in one another in our lives. For there is Jesus in you and me together and in a mother who anoints her baby and in the waiter at the restaurant this week who looked at me and said, I'm finding God again in 12 steps and down the street and a week ago, in a funeral that was held here, the orphan wailing in her grieving, telling me that she wants to know and meet my God, back to her, our God. In the angry gay man, a member of this church, angry and bitter at the United Methodist Church right now, who still says to me, love and grace is here, love and grace, God among us in this journey together, because when I cannot see, and you can, I need you, and then I see again, and then you need me on this road called life, on this journey called a maze. And slowly I see again, and maybe you do too, more than a memorized line, a way of life. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And maybe some of you are just reciting it, and that's okay. Because there's others of you who are telling the story from your heart right now because you can see. And so we come in faith and we come in doubting together to this very font to continue to tell the story for ourselves and for baby Quinn. that one day baby Quinn would grow up, will grow up, 
not having just memorized the story, but actually believing and living into the story that love lives so that Quinn might live love. 